I call this emergency school board meeting into session, into order. Um, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you all would please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Are there any changes to the agenda at this point? Okay. Then we're starting off with our presentation um, in the kind of shift of what's been happening with COVID. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time out tonight to meet and talk about this. You'll see a little bit later into the slideshow why we, when I talked to Marcia this afternoon, um, why we felt this was uh, worthy of an emergency board session. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss a, several different things, what this is and what this is not. And so the first slide, I'll just start off with some data just uh, as we walked in today. Some of this information I had over the weekend, others were different. Um, just today, this is what I reported. This is what went in your emails today. So the regular practice of the school district is to report out, to give people the understanding. Um, we know that, um, you know, people can't take action without information. And so if, for instance, I report, I report out that there are nine new cases at CHS um, that were reported today, you know, there may be a parent who says, you know what, I just need to keep my kids home for two days and they may otherwise that make, make, make them feel better or something like that and make their feel a little bit safer. Um, everyone feels very differently. That's what I've learned about this uh, situation of COVID-19, especially this year, um, is that there are a lot of different views and, uh, and, um, and opinions on kind of what's the best way to handle situations. So we try to give the factual kind of bland information so that people can make their own choices. Um, more importantly than the nine new cases today, uh, you know, we know that cases are rising all over the place across uh, New Hampshire for certain and, and also the United States. Um, that is going to take place. It will continue to rise, I would imagine, as we go indoors more and we're going to be through the winter season. Uh, the data that we have is that the cases that we have had this year um, largely have been, by and large, have been through family transmission, which is certainly what DPHS would also understand is kind of the driver of, of most cases. That's why they have um, quarantine structures around the uh, household. And when one individual in a household is ill with COVID-19, they then quarantine the rest of the household. In our school district, that actually impacts large quantities of, of learners. Uh, we have some large families, and so we've had kids miss a lot of school this year. Um, but we have not had confirmed in-school transmission at this school right here um, since the beginning of the pandemic. So we haven't had any. Uh, this is the first time we do have two clusters. Um, one for certain, as we've investigated it more, is definitely in school transmission. The other one is the state definitely is going to call it that. And we would say it, it, it's probably likely. But um, there are other factors with that that cause us to think that it could be some other issues. Regardless, we have two clusters in one location um, here and, and upstairs. And then at the same time, the middle school has four new cases reported today. HAGS, I reported one today, but later on this evening before this meeting, I got some more information that there are a couple others. Um, I think one of the bits of information is we don't share a lot of the, like if, whether these are learners or adults or anything of that nature, we try to keep people's um, privacy in check, especially if there's one new case, you know, people can figure that sort of information out 
and we try to make sure that um, only what is needed to know is known. That being said, uh, within the mix of the data that we have tonight are a lot of adult cases, and uh, that causes kind of a, a difficult situation for the school, uh, the school district. It causes, um, it, it can, and it would, would, if we continue on with that pattern, it would cause significant um, difficulties for our learners as well. So we'll continue on with this. So just some more kind of COVID-19 impact. Teachers and support staff have been impacted. Um, currently, I don't have the exact number, but certainly over half a dozen. Um, and for the year, it's been a little bit more than that. It all depends where that impact is, of course, but um, what we have learned through this process is that vaccinated or not vaccinated um, spread is, is taking place. People who are vaccinated, while that's a, a lower percentage of the cases that we've had, at least with the information that we're provided. Um, and when they're sick, they're not, I wouldn't say significantly sick, uh, but degree of illness is not in the cards for when we decide to bring a person back into school. You know, the, there are regulations that the state has provided to us that we've chosen to follow. And so when one person is out, they're out. Um, well, again, vaccinated doesn't mean that you can't get it and it doesn't mean you can't give it. And so we have had that. And while, you know, certainly probably 85 plus percent, 90 percent of our um, teacher teaching staff, maybe maybe faculty, um, I don't have all that information, but a high level, you know, would be vaccinated doesn't mean that they're not susceptible um, to COVID-19. And what that means is while they're health, um, they may not have it severely, they're out for a period of time. And that has a significant impact on our ability to provide safety and, uh, and a high quality education at the school. So um, while when you have fewer and fewer individuals who are able to be here, who know the kids and so forth, it does create a different type of situation with the school for monitoring safety and all that. So that's just an, an element, even though that's not COVID-19, that's an impact from having fewer staff. We already have, I mean, everyone knows nationwide, uh, there's a shortage on substitutes. We've been working to uh, make that situation better, shortage on um, uh, a wide array of faculty that work with learners. Um, and though we're in better shape than perhaps some places, we're not immune to that problem. Um, and it gets more difficult and difficult as we go along. So trying to mitigate from that loss of instruction and supervision is very important to us. So that's a big piece of the emergency aspect of this because we don't want there to be an actually true you know, emergency situation. I'll define what I mean by that as we go on. Um, we do have learners missing a lot of school due to quarantine or isolation. Again, I said family is the larger, largest driver of this. Um, the next largest driver would be, um, you know, mostly at the high school level, you know, they're, they're more mobile, the learners are. They drive in cars that have the windows up. They're cycling, you know, now heat that's kind of, you know, cycling the air and so forth in their vehicles. That's likely to take more place. We have had some situations where parents have reported that their kids have been in very close contact with one another in certain areas, not necessarily at the school. Um, but like for instance, JGS right now, there are 26 individuals, kids who are not in school, mostly due to family situations. So they may not have COVID themselves, but because their family members, like, so let's say, let's say uh, one of those nine high schoolers, and this is actually probably the case. I don't, I don't have, I don't know any of the names, um, but you'd have a high schooler who becomes COVID positive that automatically impacts possibly one, two, three kids at, um, you know, one at the middle school, two at JGS. Certainly um, with some of our larger families that has happened in, at Ringe and here as well. Um, and so, and then what inevitably happens is it spreads and they become 
positive. So most of the cases that I've reported have been, you know, that, um, not in the, well, a good number of them anyway. So, and then we have our nurses. Our nurses are doing a phenomenal job. They did a phenomenal job last year. This year has been a little bit different in some of the processing, but it hasn't been any easier. And um, they spend a considerable amount of time and, and they deal with a lot of irritation, um, you know, and, and for good reason, you know, people are, are tired of all of this. And so it's frustrating. What do you do when your, your kid is out or has to be out for a period of time? And so it's, it's, it's not an easy situation for anyone. Uh, I had, so this morning when I got here, I got into some meetings, you know, had all this information provided to me, talked about the data and read over the framework and realized I really didn't have any um, capability to act on anything given our framework, which is fine. Um, that's how we wrote it. And we had done such a great job with not having kind of in school spread. It wasn't something that was on our minds either. The board did a marvelous job at the beginning of last year, actually a little bit prior to last year, with making sure that it equipped everything with iWaves, make sure that we're attacking the virus in the air 100% of the time. It's happening right now. It's coming to our air systems. It's ionizing the water molecules in the air. That being said, it's not going to stop something from spreading when someone sneezes in your face. So it, it's just not going to take, that's not going to happen. Um, or is talking very closely like this. It's, it's just not likely to be able to handle that um, if someone is positive and is in the environment. So I just highlighted a little bit of, it. oh, this is the next slide. Sorry, Nick, I'm looking at it on my computer. I have it at a different speed. So this is the current language. And for the next couple slides, we'll see some of the current language or current um, charts that are in the framework. And so this, you know, we know what our matrix is. We know what the thresholds are. And the school principal does have some ability to make some changes to extend things, but it's, it's to extend once you're already in that area. And we have had that situation happen at the elementary already, where we've had a classroom where there was some spread and we had several individuals out. They masked that group for a period of time. They decided to prolong it for a, a couple more days. Um, so that process has been utilized already, but nothing here would allow me to make any sort of decision of any kind um, going with this particular situation of the high school, middle school, um, and with clusters. Um, with a change in pattern is what this is about. This is about a change in pattern. And so when we have change in patterns, you want to be able to react, um, even if it's just kind of putting things in place for just a bit of time so that you can think about it and make sure that the pattern does, is less likely to continue if it's an undesirable pattern. So um, that's just the language piece of it all. We can go to the next slide. These are results from surveys. So when people, uh, I get a lot of emails, um, anti-mask, why aren't we having masks? All, all this sort of thing. Um, you know, we, when we surveyed both staff and families at the beginning of this year, uh, the majority, the overwhelming majority said, hey, if, if we're kind of stabilized, then we're not interested in mitigation strategies. We still have some, we have some distancing and so forth. We do have some masking, um, but it's uh, under certain circumstances. The next slide, same groups of people with a different question, says if the answers, um, if things change, um, should the cases start to increase again? Uh, I would say cases in this case have increased, but also um, the fact that it actually happens with in-school transmission. That's, that's, the, that's the change in pattern. We haven't had that. And so you can see families still overwhelmingly are not interested in having a lot of um, strategies, mitigation strategies, but it does significantly change. And uh, you have a, a much larger group, that second you know, group of 
of parents saying, yeah, absolutely, let's go to back what we did last year, which is pretty extreme. Um, and then three and four in there saying something kind of in the middle. I would count two and ones in that case um, being basically don't, don't put much in there regardless of, of what takes place. And so that really splits things directly in half. And so that graph alone, along with the staff graph, which shows a, a slightly more, um, you know, the same type of conversation, but a little bit more leaning more toward the putting in strategies, um, brings us here. This, this is, these graphs are the reason why we're here because people stated, community members stated, when we start having these shifts, we have other opinions on this. And so we have different thoughts on this. And sometimes you don't know until you get into the moment and you have the types of data because not all data, all, not all numbers, not all cases, not all situations are the same. So we move along to the next slide. And so our goal and the goal that the committee that worked on the framework and the strategies and so forth that we had, had a goal of maintaining in-person learning. I'll go further and I'll, I'm throwing in co-curriculars as that in-person learning. We have for several years said, we're gonna focus on improving our uh, athletics, our, our clubs and everything. And we've, and we've made some significant gains there because for a lot of reasons, one of which is because we know social emotionally that's important for our learners. I can't believe how important um, I think that type of communication and um, interaction with each other is important, more so than I thought. So um, what we've seen that's kind of peripheral, kind of, kind of intertwined with this is that, um, again, it's, it's in the news, it's in the papers, uh, a year and a half for some learners who haven't been in a physical school setting, uh, even if they've been learning online, socially, there's a, there's a big gap. Um, and so I'm not interested in maintaining or widening that gap of um, social difficulty uh, between, you know, for instance, I'll give, I'll give the audience an example. So you might have a sixth grader coming into middle school for the first time, and they haven't really been in the school since fourth grade. They don't behave or act or understand how to engage with some of their peers because they haven't been with them. And take that with freshmen and you have high school teachers, for instance, who haven't ever taught middle school, but suddenly they're seventh grade type of uh, mentality. There's a, um, that all can change. That all, can, you know, students will learn their, their uh, plasticity is, is, is great uh, in, in their minds and so forth. And they're able to um, learn, but you have to keep them, you have to be in school to do that. And so getting the goal still is maintaining in-person learning. And so what are the things that will stop in-person learning? Well, we already know that they're absent from school because of COVID and also because of uh, quarantining. Quarantining being the big one, um, especially when families are involved. And the one where, where we control in a sense, like if, if we don't have the staff, I mean, there have been other school districts in the area that have had some staffing difficulties and have uh, chosen to go remote. Maybe they didn't choose, maybe they were forced to do so. It depends on you know what all the factors were. Um, I'm not interested in doing that. Um, we want to keep our learners in school. We want to keep our staff healthy and in school and not having to um, quarantine for periods of time because they're exposed to things. Uh, our, our staff is very careful um, inside of school, outside of school. We want to we want to make sure that we're not causing extra issues. Uh, co-curriculars. If we have clusters in those co-curricular areas, that's going to compromise our ability to compete, to play. So we want to do things to make sure that during this this season, um, you know, take basketball for instance as a, as, a, as a kind of the primary sport of the winter season. Um, staying healthy and keeping our learners in a situation where we're not having that type of in-school spread or, or groups uh, is, is important. So we have to think about that as well. That's a kind of a, a side piece, but it's an important piece. So I have some recommendations 
Um, I'm sure we're going to have conversation about this, but I figure it's not fair to come and bring you here without some thoughts. Um, CHS experienced its first transmission in a year and a half. Uh, that's a significant shift in data. We also know that regardless of um, immunization vaccine, that people can get it and they can spread it. Um, the idea of masks has been from the beginning said that it's here to protect other individuals. Not necessarily, it depends on what type of mask you're wearing, I suppose. But these types that we're wearing right now, cloth masks, uh, protect other individuals, not necessarily as much yourself. Um, we did go through all last year fully masked. And we did not have one situation of spread within this entire school. Uh, we know that. So, um, I also want to recognize that we have a lot of people, half or more, who, hey, you know, we need to keep the course where we're, where we're at. Um, and I would say, I'm not coming here to ask for a change in the matrix, for a change in any of the strategies or anything of that nature. I would say that we hadn't considered the cluster element, a situation where we have that type of break in um, pattern, uh, sudden increases, of COVID because even though uh, COVID and illness at this point in time, I can say that you know the, we have not had a lot of sick, sick uh, situations where people have been really um, knocked out, for instance, really uh, like, like what we heard in the, in the beginning of the pandemic when um, at least with our age group that we have here, um, but they nonetheless are out of school for long periods of time. So I'd like to suggest that we at least try uh, implementing uh, masking at CHS for two to three weeks and look at the data and see what the trends are. Um, I'm asking for temporary. I'm not asking for change it and make it happen all year long. I mean, that we, we all have always, through this time frame, continued every two weeks to look at what we're doing. Um, Consider maybe the same type of time frame for the middle school, um, as it's the same building and they do come into contact. I'm not, you know, it's we have not had the transition over to middle school. There is a difference. While they travel back and forth, they're not typically in the same classes. Uh, there are some eighth graders who do take some um, freshman, sophomore classes, uh, some seventh graders perhaps. Uh, but you know, when they are in those classes, the idea is if we were to consider the CHS one, they would wear masks, uh, or we would just do it for the middle school. I'd leave the current athletic protocols in place. We know that everyone has to be masked except for the people on the court. I do think that after experiencing what we experienced last year, um, being masked and going full blown down the court uh, back and forth is is very difficult, and um, it's almost impossible to. Uh, for refs to keep control of things and, and call that. They, they did a, as good a job, I think, as it could last year. Um, NHIAA and most of the schools in the area have kind of decided to take that route, um, but make sure that the fans are, are able to, um, are, are masked. I would suggest adjusting the framework language so that we wouldn't have to, in certain cases, have emergency board meetings, but give some temporary um, I'm not asking for complete control, uh, but temporary control uh, to assess a situation and to uh, implement some sort of change measure to help with uh, a situation so that we have time to kind of assess and, and know where to go. Um, That would require some language changing, I think. I just have a couple of samples there. You know, basically we could focus it on just when it's clusters uh, or confirmed in school spread. You know, this would be a, the first one to be a looser one, giving, you know, myself a little more uh, leeway. Uh, the next one would say, hey, let's just make a, a stronger case, whatever that might be. Same kind of language, but we'll say that 
you know, to break the pattern, we'll do X, Y, and Z for a period of time. You may have other ideas. You might want to not go as extreme as this. You might want to stay the course and do nothing. Um, again, I'm not as concerned because we have not seen it. We've talked a long time, but we knew that um, this strand was, was going to spread uh, more. Uh, and it certainly that has been uh, shown within the data. Uh, we haven't, we always said we would take some action, or at least I had said I would promote action if we saw that there was a lot of um, uh, significance to that spread, meaning not numbers wise, but the, uh, you know, hospitalizations, people, you know, ill, that sort of thing, um, as opposed to, you know, stuffy noses, runny noses, things of that nature, which are a little more minor. Uh, but we have this other situation where it's our goal was to be in person and to make sure that we can continue to be there. Um, if for whatever reason we did need to go remote because of staffing, I would much rather have tried to have other mitigation strategies beforehand prior to jumping to a remote learning, which I do think for long periods of time can be well, I think I think it is harmful to kids, and so I don't want to see that harm. I think we have the data on that, both academically, although not as much as I thought, um, but socially, for certain, there's no question about it. That's that data is very clear. Um, so uh, that's what I have for a presentation tonight. Thank you for listening. If I have any questions or anything like that, I can try to answer as much as I can. All right. Thanks. Um, Nick, do you mind putting the uh, agenda back up? Uh, yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay, so um, we had said we would take public comments um, next, and then after we've done We'll say I'll we'll start with 15 minutes. We'll see if we need more than that um, to get a good variety of conversation going. And then um, then the board can have our, their discussion. Um, Marcia. Yes. Is there a set, or maybe this is already um, if you have this or not, what's the set time frame for? Individuals 15 is do. what we usually set aside. That's, oh, that's per cool. individual. Per Sorry. Per, yeah, yeah, about a minute. About a minute. Because we want to get as many people as we can. So a minute. No more than two. I mean, if, but aiming for a minute. So I, I apologize in advance if I appear rude to anyone today. All right. Um, so I guess, uh, do you want me to proceed with kind of the rules for yes, uh, comments? Okay, so we do have both a physical and a digital audience. Anybody who's familiar to this process knows, but I'll just repeat all of it for the sake of those who may not be as involved. So uh, on your screen, you should see our public participation um, school board policy. So if you'd like to, if you could take a chance to read that before making a public comment, just to make sure you adhere to that policy, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, essentially, if you are, we'll, we'll establish, you know, whether we're taking in person or, um, you know, digital, if you are digital, if you could uh, use the hand raise feature, that should be an icon at the bottom of your screen that looks like a hand, you press that button, I will be able to acknowledge you, I'll be able to give you the ability to speak. And then if you could use your first name, last name, and your town of residence before making any public comment, that would be greatly appreciated. And then when it comes to those in person, I uh, do have a microphone that I can uh, bring over to you and then just obviously speak into the microphone. Um, first name, last name, town of residence again. Uh, as Marcia said, try to keep your comments to two minutes. Um, if minute, <laughs> preferably a minute. <laughs> Um, so would you like to take physical or uh, remote first, Marcia? Um, why don't we uh, start with the physical, if there's comment, um, and then we'll go remote. I believe there's not a lot of people physical, 
right? Yeah, there's there's certainly less people physical. And there's a lot more. So if we can keep it at just a couple minutes physical and then go over to the remote because there's so many more people there. Okay. Um, All right. So is it going to be just you or does anybody else want to? So we have two, yeah. three. Okay. So we have three people in person that would like the chance. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, I guess first thing's uh first. Can you hear me on this microphone? Can you hear me, Marcia? Barely, but yes. Barely? Okay. All right, how's that? Can you hear now? Oh yeah. Okay, awesome. So, so name like name and town and so forth. Yep. So first name, last name, town of residence, and then you're free to make your comment. Yes. Um, the, the camera that you're, I guess, addressing is there. You should use it uh, digital, or if you want to address the board, depending <laughs> on where you'd like to look. Okay. Um, I'm Kelly Williams. I, Jaffrey. Um, I'm a junior here at Conant. Um, I just want to say that. This year, going back to school, I think I was kind of hesitant. Like, I didn't want it to be like last year because honestly, last year really sucked. Um, with all the, you know, couldn't walk close to my friend, couldn't give her a high five, couldn't do anything like that. Um, and I think the thing that made me okay with coming back this year was that I thought that the matrix that everybody came up with was, it was good. I thought that it was a good compromise because I do believe that our community is overwhelmingly does not want masks, do not want these, these guidelines. Um, so I think that it was a really good compromise. And I think that now all of a sudden you're bringing up different points to it. You're saying, well, now there's clusters and there's this and that. And honestly, I think that the matrix was a really good compromise. And I think that if you guys didn't add in everything about clusters and you're trying to go from all these different points, you're kind of ripping the rug out from people who were okay with the compromise and we're fine with that. And we're accepting of that. And I honestly, with all respect, like, I think that's a fail. On, on the part of our staff and everybody who came up with that matrix that now you're trying to go against the people we're okay with. Um, and I also wanna say that as a student in the school right now with no mask, I don't feel unsafe. I feel like I'm good. Like I'm, I, don't, I don't feel that this is something that, you know, I'm in danger of if I'm not wearing a mask. I think that if the person next to me feels like they're unsafe or feels that they need to wear a mask to protect themselves or they need to be vaccinated, I think that's, perfectly their choice and I respect that and I have I have respect for that but I don't think that I should be forced to come to school and wear a mask for a virus that has a 99.86 percent survival rate I just want you to know that I that I feel safe thanks Kelly Paul O'Malley uh, I'm a RIND resident and I am 100% against changing any of the matrix. You guys have put a lot of work into that. And it was a compromise, like Kelly had just said, that we can, if you see the spikes, it has to hit a certain percentage, and then we mask up again. We're nowhere near those numbers. Just because there was a little cluster, I'm guessing you even said it, it's mostly family members getting this, opposed to in-school transmission. And you said last year we had zero in-school transmission. I think that was mainly because most of our stuff was, our kid was online most of the time, every Wednesday online. The, the numbers in the school were extremely less. Most of the parents kept the kids home last year. So the fact that there's a little bit more of a transmission rate this year than there was last year, it's, I mean, it's expected with the numbers that we have in the school this year. Um, I think that, if you want to wear a mask, it's, it's your right. You should be able to, but if you don't want your child to wear a mask or if you're in the school and you don't want to wear a mask, you shouldn't have to. Um, it's pretty much all I had for that. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Hello, my name is Doug Brown. I live in Jaffrey. Um, I have a different of an opinion. I mean, if we're talking about data, masking data says it reduces the spread of this virus. That is true can't say that's false. So we do have clusters. We have to remember that if someone, if your child gets it or is a close contact, it doesn't just affect your child. It affects your entire family. You don't go to work. You can't pay bills. 
So I think that like asking someone to wear a mask is the minimum. I'm not in favor of remote learning, but the reality of it is wear a mask. It's proven to stop the lessen the spread of this virus. Yeah, you're right. Not everybody's dying of this virus, but I don't want my kid to get sick. I don't want to get sick because then I miss work. I have bills to pay. So if I have a mask or my child's wearing a mask and they both wear a mask right now in school. So they don't have a problem wearing a mask. They believe they're protecting their friends and themselves. So I agree with, you know, I think there should have been masks way before this, but the reality of it is if we had masks, maybe we didn't have these clusters like we had now. So that's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. All right, if we can uh, go to some of our remote yeah, of audience. Course. All right, so let me just pull up the list real quick. All right, so we'll just take them in order. And uh, again, same rules apply as, as the uh, physical audience. First, we have Chase. So do you unmute Chase or does Chase unmute Chase? Uh, Chase should be able to unmute okay. himself. Okay. Hello? Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Chase Seppala and I'm from Ringe. I'm in seventh grade and I go to I attend JRMS. I'm attending the meeting to address the masks, mask situation. I think masks should be optional to wear during school because masks restrict your breathing. They are pain to wear and some people may not like to wear masks. My first reason why masks should be optional to wear during school is masks restrict breathing. So I and probably everyone would like to breathe during school. And if you want to be safe, then get your kid or yourself or both of you vaccinated because vaccinations are open pretty much everywhere. My second reason why masks should be an option to, if you want to wear one, is masks are a pain. First, you have to buy them, and some people can't afford to buy masks because they don't get enough paid like that. And then the second reason why masks are a pain is you have to wash them because they get dirty super easily because you're wearing them and you're just spinning in them. Yeah. My last reason why masks should be optional at school is some people don't like masks and they may feel uncomfortable wearing masks. Also same, people get rashes from wearing masks for a long period of time. In conclusion, I think masks should be optional for everyone. Thank you, Chase. All right. And next we have Liz. Hi, my name is Liz Pipitone from Ringe. I have three kids in RMS. And I just wanted to um, just highlight the fact that last year there were no um, spread cases in the districts and there was, everyone was wearing masks. And it's, it's not that big of an imposition to just wear masks and just why, why should we take the chance and, you know, play jeopardy with whether or not our kids get this virus that can make you very ill or worse. So that's um, my opinion. I think that we should um, go ahead and just wear them through the, the cold uh, months of the season, especially with winter break approaching. Uh, there's going to be a lot of new germs coming in from out of state. So let's just mask up, get through it, and have a better spring. Thanks, that's all. Thank you, Liz. All right, next we have uh, Jennifer Clark. Can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Okay. Okay, Jennifer Clark from Jaffrey, New Hampshire. I do have a daughter in JRMS. I need to make a comment and she would like to make a comment. Before the meeting tonight, I did watch WMUR and they are reporting 4,000 new cases 
within the last five days in New Hampshire alone. Um, those numbers are not going to get better as the holidays approach us. I think the board should consider having masks at CHS as well as JRMS. Um, for example, my daughter does do classes at, at Conan, even though she's an eighth grader. She is also on the track team at the high school. So you do have that co-intermingling where it would not make sense to have just CHS students um, where there are so many other JRMS students that are also entering the high school, taking classes, doing sports with them. Um, so I feel because the schools are so closely related, that would be a very smart issue to consider. Also, my daughter, Grace, would like to make a comment at this time. Hi, um, I'm Grace Clark. Um, I go to eighth grade uh, at the school. Um, I just wanted to make a comment comparing from last year towards this year. I was remote entirely last year because it was very dangerous to go to the school with COVID. We did not know much about it, and we still don't, though. Um, personally, if you compare towards last year when you were social distancing and wearing masks compared to right now, we've had more COVID cases already transmitting from students to students more than in general last year with COVID cases itself from the entire district. I've already done like my research upon it. We've had way more cases total than last year already. And I personally think if we would wear masks just maybe into a holiday break, um, it could personally save students because um, we all have different points of views on it. Like I have a little brother who is severely high risk to COVID. He can't like go to like anywhere or anything. He can die if he gets COVID. He has a severe like immunocompromise disorder. So like looking at from that point of view, it's hard to share it to others, like how you feel that way. So it's just like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Grace. All right. Next we have uh, Sheila Nagel. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, I'm Sheila Nagel. I'm a Jaffrey resident. Um, I just wanted to say that we, we do have a matrix right now that was voted on. And this community as a whole does not want force masking on our children. My question is, if you guys go away from our matrix and decide to vote to mask our kids, what options are you going to give us? Are you also going to offer remote for, to us as well if we don't want our child being masked at this time? If you look at other schools in our area who mask 100% of the time, they actually have more COVID cases than we do. I personally feel that if you choose to mask our kids, you're, step, you're like kind of overstepping and starting to make medical decisions for our children. And that's really not what the role of our school board is. Um, we're currently only at 10% of our students with illnesses, not necessarily COVID, but just out with illnesses. Um, and the matrix states that we don't mask until we hit 20. Please stick to our matrix and let it be an option whether or not people want a mask. If they, if they feel that it's, they're at risk, they can put a mask on. If not, they don't have to. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sheila. All right, next we have Kim. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Hi, Kim. I guess I would like to stress the point that, sorry, Kim, could you tell us your full name and then the town? Oh, Kim Clark Jaffrey. I have a son in high school. Thanks. And I am definitely for masking. And uh, I just wanted to stress the point that if someone chooses to wear a mask, it's it's really, not going to protect like Ruben had mentioned that unless someone wears a fitted N95 mask you know and you can wear the mask you're still not protected you can still get the the germs through the mask so I, I really just wanted to stress that point okay. and appreciate your your time thank you Kim Uh, 
All right, next we have Lydia Hatch. Hello, this is Lydia Hatch and I live in Ringe, New Hampshire. And I just wanna applaud the um, school board and the staff there at the schools because a couple of the earmarks of good planning is to be flexible and recognize when the situation is changing and to sit down and communicate with people what those changes are reflecting. And I think you're doing your level best to do both of those things because the situation is changing by the day. I work in the field of government and it is changing by the day. And so thank you, Ruben and the rest of you for recognizing it and coming to us to bring our attention to this so that we may move forward in the safest manner possible. Thanks, Lydia. So um, that's been 15 minutes. I suspect there's more hands. I, I don't know. Uh, right now we have two more hands. Um, okay. Well, why don't we do that? And then let's give the, the board an opportunity to talk about what they've heard and what their opinions are. All right, so next we have uh, Rona Nordahl. Are you, are you there? We can't seem to hear you. No, I mean, yes. it's clear that she's like gone mute and unmute, but there's no- Yeah, I'm seeing the mute and unmute, but I'm not seeing any audio feed coming in. No. Maybe, uh, um, yeah, okay. Sorry, Rona. We have uh, Gina. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. I'm Gina Scott from Jaffrey. Um, I've got a child in JGS and in CHS. As much as I absolutely despise and deplore masks, I think that we should mandate them. I mean, let's not wait another two to three weeks and see how many more cases. It's not necessarily just about the students and the staffs getting it. Like my son just recovered from COVID. Luckily he didn't get sick, but we live in a household where I have two compromised individuals. So trying to keep an individual and I've got a pretty big house. So it was fairly easy for me, but not everybody has a huge house to try keeping one person away from you know, the rest of the household. I don't think it's much of an inconvenience to mandate masks for a couple of weeks. Yes, it's going to be awful. Kids are gonna hate it um, and it's, it's miserable. But the alternative to potentially losing a family member, I think it's a small ask. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much, Gina. Mm -hmm. All right, so are we officially closing public comments? If we have no other hands raised, uh, it one more hand came in, but it was post the uh, window of um... the fifteen. Yeah. Um, well, I guess part of me, I'm willing to take one more since we were unable to get Rona. Okay. All right. So last comment right here. It would be uh, G Quill. Is this George? Hello? Yeah, it, it's faint, but yes. Uh, okay, I'll try to speak up. Uh, George Quill, Range. Yep, uh, hi, George. Thanks for taking me. I know I've raised my hand late. Um, I, just, I just want to say it, 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 it saddens me to hear um, some of the people that are crippled with fear. Um, and and, I, and I, 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 I empathize with them. But I worry about the tyranny of the minority um, forcing other people and students to do something we've already evaluated before. 
And uh, you know, it's good we're, we're updating the data, but regarding temporary powers, um, they're never temporary, really. We're, we're day 600 something into, into 15 days to slow the spread. Um, the governors are all hanging on to their emergency powers. Um, I think the best thing to do is stick with the plan we had and, and keep us informed. You know, as, as a lot of people have said, you know, thank God the kids aren't getting ill. You know, a case is a case and there are other factors, but you know, we need to react like adults, not extreme fearful children, you know. So that's it. Thank you for taking my life on it. And thanks for the information. I, I, I wish there was more than two hours notification. I think we would have got a lot of a lot of input on this if it was at least a day, but that's that's just my two cents. Thank you. Thanks, George. Okay. Um, board discussion. You go first. I get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> facilitating it. <laughs> uh, Put up the recommendations again, please. Yeah. All right. So basically what we're here is we in our matrix gave um the superintendent uh the authority to um call like if there was a cluster to say okay this um this classroom this school whatever um has should mask up because of the level within that and we had a an instance our RMS where the class did that. Um, however, it in the framework, we say elementary. And where we're finding the issue right now is at the middle school high school building. So I think there isn't that authority for um, our superintendent to do the same thing in all the schools. So I think that's my understanding of, of what we're really talking about here. So thoughts, comments, corrections of my thinking? I think that the framework refers to uh, extension of conditions once the um, level in the matrix changes. In other words, the number of uh, kids that are ill triggers a certain level in the matrix. Once it's been triggered, I think the framework gives authority for principal and others to then extend that period of time. Am I correct? That is correct. And the reason for what Marcia said that where we have uh, a block of information there about our like uh, RMS or JGS is because they have um, those classes are separated already. So it, the, uh, the kind of thought process within the whole framework was to be able to um, do targeted interventions where need be. Uh, the, the struggle with that is uh, when we look at these cases here, is that those those learners are traveling all over the place within, you know, and so locking it down makes it very difficult. Um, so there's a difference between the elementary and the middle. Uh, Can I ask uh, the two clusters, the two current clusters, are either of those extracurricular related? No. So, um, uh, yes, you can ask. No, they're not related. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, well, are any of those individuals involved in extracurriculars? Yes. But the clusters themselves, the clusters are targeted. themselves were targeted, yes, in classrooms. So, just to clarify my understanding of remote, which um, remote as an option for people who don't want their 
learners to wear masks is extremely expensive for our school district because we would have to have potentially extra staff, which we've already had a difficult time hiring substitutes. Yeah, the answer to the question that was asked about remote options is there would not be any remote options. And even if we were to just shut down and go to remote, um, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's my understanding that um, the state of New Hampshire doesn't recognize COVID related remote days as learning days. And so those days would have to be made up at the end of the school year. Is that correct? The last information that I had read was that, that was the case. Uh, I do think that there's some conversation around that um, and that might be put aside, but okay. for now, the message from the Department of Education is to use it in a targeted way, similar to what we were talking about with, you know, we had that issue in uh, RMS uh, where some individuals were, you know, had in, in one, one class had, uh, it had transmitted. We put the mask in place for about five, six days. I think it was five originally, and then it was extended like two, two more days or whatever. Um, so it was very targeted. It wasn't toward everyone. We know very well that, you know, the, the, uh, the idea of the uh, framework was um, not to just do a one size fits all type of approach, but to handle things when the data showed us to handle it. Now we have, I'm, and I'm taking my view of data as in how do we make sure we stay in school in person? To me, both educationally and safety wise for our learners, the safety element from, for my perspective within the school has more to do with the fact of just being socially um, uh, appropriate. Uh, there, while we're not having perhaps as much of an issue at our um, school here, probably because we were in school so much last year, most of our learners were, uh, there are stories of other schools having flights constantly every single day. Uh, people just aren't, kids are not um, behaving in the same manner. And you can read that on any of the national uh, you know, news that that's the case that's happening. It is, it's happening in this state as well. And so a lot of the damage that happened is when kids weren't in school. When you go a year and you don't have structure and you go two months and you don't have structure, and then suddenly someone, you have, you know, new structure and you haven't, it, it's very different. Uh, so that, that's the kind of thing we want to be able to kind of catch up uh, with our social and, and our academic for certain. Um, both can happen, but we do need to be in person. And that's been our goal from the beginning. So how um, granular is the data if there are, uh, not yet, there are, 18 active positive cases in the middle school and high school mm -hmm. combined currently yeah. currently and have the nurses been able to contact individuals that those people have in contact with i mean right so in theory out there listening right now mm -hmm. are parents who were notified today that their learner was in contact with a person who's now come down with covid oh not necessarily okay no that's, that was last year's process. Okay. We aren't doing that level of contact tracing. Okay. Uh, they are notified uh, when there's a, when there's been a couple to, to watch for that. Um, we've discussed today about um, basketball or swimming or any of those other sports that if we do have a case or two, when we you know, notify parents to just basically monitor Mm -hmm. That's what DPHS is saying. Monitor if there are cases like that. And does that then um, does that notification that I'm not going to I'm not criticizing by saying this lack of notification does that send to staff as well or do like staff Susie's it, I'm just going to use a word, like the name not real name Susie's here today but not there tomorrow. Does that mean that Susie has it has an illness in the classroom but no one knows what that illness is. The teacher doesn't know that, that we don't they've been exposed, we don't, we don't I guess is mine. We don't differentiate. Illness versus COVID. Mm -hmm. However, we do know that there's 18, specifically of COVID, not that's mm -hmm. illness. Okay. Yeah. I have that um, in the number of people who are 
out for quarantine purposes and um, you know following the guidelines of DPHS or DHS. Other thoughts? So Ruben, can you help clarify for us what the major risk is if we do not take those four steps up there in terms of recommendations? Well, one and two are, are similar, first of all. Uh, two is mainly because JRMS is part of the same building. Uh, if we were going to be more specific with kind of how we do things at the elementary schools, it's it's technically not the target area, JRMS. CHS would be the target area. And then any JRMS learner who goes into classes with CHS would be required to kind of follow, follow suit if that number one were done. Um, three, there's no action to be taken. Uh, it was just that I'm sure that I put it in there because I thought there might be a conversation around, well, what about kids having masks on the basketball court while they're running back and forth or, you know, yeah, I guess you wouldn't wear it while you're swimming. Um, and then the last part four is if we, if the board felt it was the right thing to do to do number one, which is really the actionable item here, that uh, to adjust the framework for the, the, to reflect the language for the purpose of why we're doing it so that we don't have to come back to this stage on a repetitive basis. Um, you know, when we talk about pattern changes, we're talking about uh, cer certainly the numbers. I mean, we stay pretty, pretty stable with, we've had high numbers. We've had, you know, sometimes they've been lower, sometimes they've been higher. Uh, and, uh, but like I said, the difference in this case is the internal transmission. And when that's taking place, you want to be able to make sure that it's under control, kind of take some time to reevaluate that. Um, we, do, we do know that, you know, there are a lot of individuals were uh, with a lot of other people during this past time frame. So if there's an opportunity to uh, potentially, you know, slow some of that spread so that we're not having, uh, certainly I, I'm not interested in families getting sick or students getting sick, but I'm also not interested in staff members being lost at a time when we are at the lowest in in the nation that we've ever been in that type of realm. Certainly we're, we're no different than that, that situation because uh, we want to remain in school. The, uh, so four is, like I said, four is just simply putting some language in place so that we would not have to come back to the table for this, for this reason. But another pattern could be, for instance, we just learned that there's another variant. Um, it's not in our nation yet at this point in time is my understanding, uh, no, not, not reported anyway. Uh, again, not much is known about it. Uh, we as a public school have to, you know, watch and look at what, what are the, um, what's the impact? You know, the report right now is that it's highly spreadable. There's not a lot of information on the, uh, the severity of it, and maybe it's not, but what if it came back and we, we had that situation that we're dealing with in the springtime, that wasn't something that was known beforehand. We would have to relook at that. What if you know, we were having severe illness as a result and it was more of a um, life-threatening situation? You know, you'd make a different choice. And so that's that's my point with, I'm not looking to go away from our matrix. Um, I'm really not looking to go away from what the, I think the intent of the framework is already in place as, as Marcia pointed out that we have done this already with the elementary school uh, for a short period of time. I'm not saying, Let's, I know that there are many people who would want masks right from here on out, just do it all the way through. I get that. Um, I'm looking to break patterns um, and to then go from there. So you had said that this, our meeting now is the result of two things. Mm -hmm. You having meetings today with very interested parties in the school, Nurses administrators, the teachers, yep. I'm sure, I'm sure yep. people who are concerned about this level. Mm -hmm. Nurses saying we need to do, we need 
this is a shift. This is something new. Yeah. And that you're looking for a little bit of wording to put some more clarity into the matrix, not to change it completely, just to add a paragraph saying, okay, in this, this brings something new into it. We want to edit this. Looking at your recommendations, it seems to me that we actually only probably want to deal with four because everything else will fall under that. If we say tonight, yes, we want to choose the sample language of the first paragraph I would recommend over the second, then that puts this into your court to say mm -hmm. with the nurses and the admin and the people living this, because mm -hmm. what, what we didn't hear tonight was any, but any of the, anybody who's working here you know, talking about this and I, and working in schools, we know this is a major concern. Um, so if we just change four, add a little bit of language, just to give you a little bit of leeway to be able to say with consultation, we can do this. We know that you've been very transparent about informing everybody when, when there's issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm certain that you would tell us all when, when things are changing there, mm -hmm. but doesn't seem to me that we need to vote on whether we're going to mask that doesn't seem to me that's even on our that's that wouldn't be inappropriate as much as this. it doesn't have to be so oh. i'll make it quite clear if you put in four language that would re allow me to you know go forward i would be putting in place number one at okay. the very least yes. I, I would heavily recommend that whatever you do for chs you have to do for jrs mm -hmm. it's you we've chosen to combine these two schools they are way too integrated to, to separate them. So I would suggest that the last thing we would want to do tonight is adjust the framework. Okay. This is just my suggestion. Given the fact that most of you have only had a few hours notification, you've had a few, you know, an hour discussion, and we're talking about changing the framework uh, based on uh, very little time to consider it. So I would suggest if we want to address the framework that we do it next Monday at the board meeting, mm -hmm. and when you've had an opportunity to see what the change is, consider um, the unintended consequences of those changes, and then have an opportunity to, to discuss different variation of those changes. So, so that, that would be my suggestion about number four. Um, as you said, there's no suggestion on number two. Um, I just looked at the state numbers, and if we're looking at ages uh, 10 through 19, we have more 10 through uh, the five, uh, excuse me, seven day average number of cases is higher now than it ever was during the uh, state of emergency. And the, the ages zero to nine, you would expect them to be higher, but, and, and they are. They're about three times, but the highest was during the state of emergency. So we should expect, and I believe that the people who put the matrix together expected that we were going to get a higher number of cases come the fall uh, than what we uh, got during the emergency. So it's, it's, it's real and it's here. The, the thing that, that concerns me, I should say one of the things that concerns me is the thought that uh, vaccination prevents COVID, and it doesn't. What it does is it prepares your body to fight the infection so that if you do get COVID, you don't get as seriously ill. And what that means is that we have vaccinated students and staff who can catch COVID even though they're vaccinated. And then when that does, when they do catch it, even though the, the case may be mild, they still have to quarantine the same number of days that they would if it was a you know heavily severe case, and uh, they so that presents a problem in terms of the number of students that we have out, but it also presents a problem in terms of the number of staff we have out, and and with a large number of staff out, substitute teachers are hard to find before COVID. Now that we have it, it's very 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 difficult. So I would be hopeful that when we do a change to the framework language, we not only talk about a matrix for uh, students, but we also talk about a matrix for um, being able to deliver 
um, in-person training or in-person learning to those students. In other words, uh, at some point in time, I, I, I asked earlier what would happen if you had you know, a teacher out and you couldn't get a sub. Well, basically those students end up having a study hall. And that's not, from my perspective, that's not learning. That's not helping uh, kids if they're missing a, an entire week or two of a, of a given class to you know, just go to study hall. That, that's what we need to do is figure out how we can address that as well. Could I have a point of clarification? It's is that the case that if somebody is vaccinated that they have to quarantine for the full 10 days? I thought that that was not, I thought they only had to quarantine if they had symptoms. If they have the symptoms, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking Which about means if, if, they they catch, have, if they have COVID. If they have COVID, yeah. And yeah, if they're If they test positive for it. Yeah, if they, they test positive. It's, they could be out for 10 days? Yes, I believe so. So I have a question. Um, why, when the matrix was put together, was it specified elementary? Elementary, because the idea there was that um, the because it was self-contained. That it was self-contained. One, it was easy to put in something simple for that specific group of people. Was easy, like we would know was targeted. I think the other piece is that. Um, if there was sort of a spread or a pattern within that one area, that self-contained area, that you wanted to stop it as fast as you possibly could so that it wouldn't go to 50%, 60%, 70% of, of a class because they're all fairly close-knit together. That was the idea within right. elementary. Yeah. Right. Because I'm just, I mean, you know, we're in a situation where we have cluster, but it's not elementary. And... I would have thought we'd want to contain things. So I, I'm a bit surprised, I guess, that there wasn't another layer in there, but mm -hmm. I guess we didn't think about that one. So, all right. So, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to, uh, I guess, suggest that we do something tonight because we've been asked to come in and I assume that the reason we've been asked to come in is that there's concern that uh, waiting until next week to act could have negative consequences. And, uh, <clears throat> if, if I've understood the negative that we're most concerned about, it's that we could lose the opportunity of in-person learning uh, if we don't take action, that we could have more teachers out, that we could have more students out and uh, find ourselves unable to continue the way we've been for the last few months. So if, if that's the case, if I'm understanding you, Ruben, then I would like to take action, I think we should take some action. And that doesn't preclude considering what else needs to be done between now and next week. But if there's action that should be taken, then let's, let's do it so that we can continue in person. Uh, the, the, in terms of the sample language, uh, you know, we, we hire you as a school board to- Superintendent. To take care of uh, many different things and to consult with people as appropriate. And we see that you've done that. And so uh, I, I don't think the second language is necessary, in my own opinion, at least the first sample language. In the event of a COVID 19 cluster or confirmed in building spread, the superintendent in consultation with the building principal and nurses will determine if individual mitigation strategies are needed on a temporary basis. That, that sounds to me reasonable. I would support that. And uh, I, I guess there's one other thing I'd just like to add. I would hope that people who are not vaccinated 
and who are on the fence have been thinking about it. I, I hope that they will step up and get the vaccination. It's not just for yourself, even if you're feeling that you could fight off the virus if you get it. It's for those who might become infected by you before you even know. And it could be transmitted from one student to another. That other student might not even know that a student he's been in close contact with has the virus and can then bring that home to grandma or grandpa or maybe to mom or dad. So for anybody who's thinking about it and who hasn't made up their mind, but who's on the fence, I, I, I hope people will take action. That's my, I'll stop there. I, I have to say, and I'll just finish up. I, I think I heard you say, Wilbin, that neither teachers nor classmates who have been in contact with other students or teachers uh, who have COVID-19 are being advised that they have been exposed. And if that's the case, I, I have to say that that concerns me. All right, thanks, John. Um, does, are there other people who have thoughts or comments? I mean, it sounded like John was ready more or less to make a motion, but I wanna make sure that people have, um, have had their chance. I have a question, Marcia. Yeah, go for it, Alicia. Um, I guess I'm curious why the suggestion is to, I guess, put something in place for three weeks um, or why our target is winter break rather than the five day cycle of reviewing data per our matrix. So I'd like to understand that suggestion a little bit better. Sure, no, uh, yeah, I mean, right. We have the current language that says a school principal in consultation with the school nurse and the superintendent can decide to extend the given level beyond the five day period. Um, and as I was thinking and listening to Charlie, you know, to have that period and then, you know, talk about things at this next school board meeting would be an option as, as well, um, whether to extend or not, or to change the language as is. That's, that's uh, an option. So the, but the answer to your question specifically as to why two to three weeks, um, it was, you know, the, the trend information that we have is that uh, more and more individuals are certainly, especially at the high school level, are uh, very mobile. They're very much getting together, sleepovers, things of that nature. By the way, it's important to note that if you sleep over and you're a close contact with somebody that's actually in the definition of being a family member and, and you end up having to quarantine and so forth so that's come up with several times um the uh there, there seems to be uh, because of the start of kind of coming into school and also we're having about the tryouts and so forth the idea was to be cautious during this time frame so that we would have that success leading up to the holiday season that was the reason for two to three weeks. But five days and reviewing where things are at uh, is accomplishes something similar. That's what we've done in the elementary school. That is what we, we have, have done. Already. That, that is the practice that's already been done, yes. The difference is we could isolate to a class. This is not, this is not the same. That's, that's the difference. I think I'd like to comment. I, I, I agree. I'm a little concerned about, you know, a little more concerned now about that we're going to rely on um, peers telling uh, peers, notifying peers, hey, guess what? I've got COVID. And then peers telling, telling the parents, hey, Susie's got, again, fake name, Susie's got COVID. And then that family saying, oh, you guys are just together last weekend. You have to quarantine for the next few weeks or without the nurse's intervention to say, yes, you two were together. You, you know what I mean? It, it, there's a lot of gray area there. And I think maybe that's part of this trending in that 
folks aren't quarantining, which there's not a lot. I went back and I, I read an uh, email from a parent and I, I apologize, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say who it was. This was back like three, six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. And they said, you know, the teeth part of this matrix is a little weak, right? Like we gotta make sure that the, there's hard and fast decision-making. And this is an area that's very gray. It's not very strong. And I think that quarantining is part of the solution and we're not covering that up. So if, to, if we were together over the weekend and I'm sick, but I tell you I'm sick, but you might go to school. Like you might, yeah, I feel fine, mm -hmm. I feel great. Three days later, you've just been around a whole bunch of people, but there's no connection to the school at all in terms of right. that true quarantine. So yeah, so sometimes there's some communication if we have the information, but there's no formal contact tracing on all that, unless DPHS says we need to go and do something. So they're, they're following, the nurses are following that process. So the, the matrix of DPHS has actually got rid of that whole process and focused entirely on their definition. It's a, it's a big definition of family, or if you're with someone like say if we knew that someone was sleeping over someone's house then yes there would be contact and things if we found out there were a couple um situations within a class period but not a cluster a cluster would be three or more um then there we have a letter that we send out to let people know um but, so there is so if a yeah. student is in if music mm -hmm. and someone is in music and they have gone home sick with COVID, mm -hmm. then a letter might go out to that class and that teacher, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, what's, what's the purpose, right? You, you, you should always, this, the idea is that you should always be looking at your own symptoms and so forth and understand that you have probably, in, wherever you go, been exposed to someone who has been um, COVID positive. If we find that there's, all right, there's, a, there's one data point, okay, that's not a pattern. Two bad points is not a pattern either. That's why three, three. So you have an incident, a coincidence, and then you have a pattern. But when you hit that coincident, you're like, okay, there might be something here. Please look out for that. Um, and then keep us apprised, basically, of what's going on. And that's how we find out you know, kind of where clusters are. The nurses are doing, <coughs> excuse me, some level of tracing because they're finding out where the student is at, what buses they're on. And so when they give me the information every day, I know what bus that learner's on or um, the clubs that that person's involved with, um, other classes, you know, they let's say that this person's in this class. Uh, if I get five cases, they'll say, all right, um, and I'll, I'll report out if there's a cluster, of course, but it's typically, they don't have anything in common. Um, it's kind of the idea. And so we wouldn't send any information out about that. And certainly no information that would cause people to um, say you have an individual in a classroom, one individual, and that person's out. And then you, whether it be an adult or a child, you send something home saying that they've been exposed to COVID. Well, you just gave identifiable right. uh, medical I, information to someone. So we, do we don't understand. do that. Um, the other piece of this is we've heard tonight and presented tonight, I, I understand that the, the possibility of someone getting um, significantly ill is always there with anything, with any type of illness. Uh, we put COVID and illness together because of the uh, severity level for this particular age group and the fact that there could be some that people were vaccinated and so forth or had the opportunities to do so. Uh, and now everyone has the opportunity except for four-year-olds in preschool. Uh, to be able to be vaccinated if that's something that the family wants to do. Um, so, you know, at this point in time, the issues are really about stopping a pattern, making sure that our staff remain uh, healthy uh, as much as possible, keep them in school so that we can have a normal, as normal a school year as possible and continue in that direction. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. When we did uh, have an intervention mm -hmm. in the elementary school mm -hmm. because we had a cluster. Mm -hmm. What was the result of that five-day period of mask mandatory masks? Uh, we didn't have any other issues after uh, that af after that five-day period of time, six-day maybe period of time. Um, and actually, RMS in general has had fairly low numbers in in, in general. 
Jaffrey, we, I think, did it once, maybe in a preschool. Um, again, it, it's, it did stop or slow things down, or at least the data, whether I can, whether I can tell you it's causation, that's you know, perhaps not true, but I can say that they coincide with the data decreasing. So it doesn't change the fact I, I, I do because I have a lot of emails on that one. It doesn't change the fact that um, you get a lot of you know families who are impacted in very significant ways um, during that time frame as a result of those kids getting sick. So there is another piece of this when they're sick. What what separates COVID from other illnesses? You know, um, and which is why it's slightly different and why we still track this is because we have regulations on what has to happen when someone has COVID. And so when that happens, it impacts, it has a domino effect and impact. And when it happens with adults in our school, that the impact's much larger on everybody. And so we're trying to, um, and certainly we, we made the matrix so that there was a lot more flexibility. Uh, the committee wanted to do that. I was not part of the committee, but I got the information from the committee. It took into consideration those graphs that I showed. Um, and, you know, while, again, the overwhelming majority don't want to have any mitigation strategies or very few, there was a good portion that said, but if we see changes in patterns, again, listening to what the people said and what they gave us for information, yeah, let's, let's do something. Um, there were still people who wanted to say, let's do nothing, but there's a, a good group of people, 50% group of people said, let's do something. Some want to do a ton more. I'm not asking for a ton more. I'm just asking for a period of time. Is there a possibility that the ad hoc committee could get back together? Well, we have the ad hoc committee getting back together every single quarter. Um, we, when we, whenever we put a framework in place, we've been adjusting right. they it as met we go in along. October. They met and they, at the time, so right. no, I think whatever we're all. doing is working. Um, and so uh, that's, that's where they're at. Could we get them together again? and take a look at it, you know, doing that could put some expectations on them. Like, why are we getting together so soon? That type of thing. So um, is there, I guess, is there a motion from anyone that about any kind of action tonight? Um, and then also, you know, not a motion or anything, but an understanding going forward. Um, you know, at our regular board meetings, we continue obviously to do this. I'll tell you where I'm at, Marcia. Yep. Um, we have demonstrated that when we've encountered a cluster, if we've gone to masks in that clustered area, for five days, it's had a positive result. Yep. The issue is the issue is that in a high school, you don't you can't isolate the clustered area. Yep. What you have to do is if you go to masks, you have to go to the entire building. And that's the question that we're wrestling with, at least that I'm wrestling with. It's it's one thing if I could focus on a cluster and mask that cluster for five days, but if, if, if the cluster, in order to get to that cluster, I have to do the entire school, that's a significant um, I don't want to use the word inconvenience, but it's a significant um, effort on a lot of people. And on the other side, so of what's things, the, so what's the, the pleasure of the board? That if we don't act, we could see a spread that engulfs. Well, not engulfs, but that leads us to a remote learning situation that we're not prepared to implement. Well, the only way we could move to remote is if we didn't have the staff to to do that. 
and, and so what I'm saying is we've had an increase in staff being out due to COVID. That has been a, that that is a factual thing. I'm trying to that's I'll, maybe I wasn't as straightforward with that. And so my concern and and some staff has been as a result of the um, the areas that we discussed. I think that's been one of my concerns is that when we say a total of 18 positive COVID cases, mm -hmm. we have not differentiated between the number of students. One third of those staff. cases there are staff members. And last year's matrix did differentiate mm -hmm. the number of yeah. staff that were out versus in that factored into the matrix, which helped us understand better the totality with which our whole the, the, you know, district operated under, you, you know, from a safety, not from just health but health and safety from coverage and certainly the learning impacts. Um, and we're not, that's only ones that are COVID that doesn't count the ones that include people who are ill for other purposes. Mm -hmm. so we, don't, we don't know that number either. Right. And yet today's COVID numbers on our matrix on our website the community transmission percentage of learners out due to illness only covers students, not adult, not teachers or instruction. Mm -hmm. that, that's true. Um, Do you know what the percentage would be including stuff? Well, well, the percentage, it would not hit that 20% mark. With a third of the staff out, how were those classes being covered? I'm not saying a third of the staff. A third of the um, 18. A third, COVID. Of the, a third of the cases, total cases would be staff. A third members. of the 18. That's right. Okay, sorry. That's what I meant. So with a that's still substantial for the size of the high school staff. How are those classes being covered? High school, middle school staff, yeah. Um, the we have some substitutes. Um, we also have individuals, teachers in the school who you know, cover those classes during like a planning period. Um, they're paid to do that if they so choose. Uh, we, I wouldn't say we have a large number of individuals who do that, but we have some who consistently uh, choose to do that. So that's helpful. Um, we do have a couple permanent subs now that have, you know, helped out. Uh, there are, if COVID were the only thing, that would be one, th there are other reasons why staff members are out. So it's, it's a compounded issue. It's not just one thing. So if someone's out on, say, uh, maternity leave, or um, is ill, or there's a uh, death in the family, or something like that, you know, those all the normal situations of, of why people are absent um, are still there. And then uh, you know, and then there's certain circumstances where this year we're a little understaffed anyway because we don't have the hiring capacity to be able to get the people we need. I think we look on school spring today, usually around this time of year. It's like nationwide 20,000 teaching jobs or education jobs open. I think it's over 85,000 right now, just open positions. That's, that's a, a huge, it, it's a piece of data that is national and it's worse in other areas of the country, but it's still impacting this area of, this, of the country as well. So we have that going on. So we have a lot of things happening all at the same time. And so where we can control and try to mitigate from them being uh, ill, absent, things of that nature, we would like to try to do so. So uh, I guess I'm kind of back to, um, is there going to be an action of some sort tonight? And then looking forward going, okay, so, We've talked tonight about the staff uh, component to the matrix not being there. Maybe that should um, also, you know, the issue of how do we best mitigate clusters in the middle school, high school. Um, I thought there was another one too that's kind of left me right now. <coughs> but it, there seems like there's a few maybe kind of longer term 
framework kind of things, but there's also something that's fairly pressing that, you know, we just came off of a holiday, we've got more holidays coming, and um, today we had a significant jump, um, and we have two clusters. Are we going to try and mitigate those clusters some way right now? And then that buys us enough time to maybe think more deeply about our matrix and other tweaks that may need to happen. So Marcia, could yes. you pull yes. could you pull the board and ask if the board member wants to take an action tonight or not? And then after that, we can figure out what the action is. If we okay. Okay, yep, I can do that. Not a problem. John. Yeah, I, I think I've already said, I think we should take some action because we've been called together and asked to look at this on an emergency basis. And, you know, I trust Ruben's judgment that he would not have been, would not have asked us to come here if he didn't have a concern. However, okay. however, I would throw out one modification to Charlie's request for consideration. Uh, I have listened to different things that have been said here, and they a lot of them make sense, including what Charlie said about five days perhaps being enough at this point. I've heard Ruben say, yes, that could work. I, I guess what I'd like to know is what would Ruben like us or recommend that we do tonight? That would make it a little easier for me Okay, so Ruben, before you respond, shall I finish my little survey and then yes, that's fine. you can modify, you know, you gave us recommendations already, yeah. but maybe yeah. after you're hearing all this, you would like to modify some recommendations. I don't know, but let me finish one part and then we'll go back. All right, Christine. I would like to take an action this evening. Okay, thank you. Lisa. I would like to not take an action this evening. I would like the ad hoc committee to meet and to make a recommendation. I feel that I'm surprised people are surprised at clusters. I'm surprised people are surprised that we have heavy, heavier COVID cases when we have windows shut and can't get outside and holidays. I None of this surprises me. I don't understand why yeah, I, I I don't understand why this is a surprise. I, I'm not, I'm confused. Um, I think it's terrible that we have this much COVID happening around us. I think that we've all seen, like this has been written out for us for months that this is coming. And so I don't understand why this is a change now. Um, yeah, I would, I would love to be fully masked. I would love for all winter until we can all open windows again for us to be fully masked. The fact is, is that masks protect you from me. They don't protect me from you. So that's, that's just science. You know? So I would love it if everybody masked. I, we just came a few weeks ago and changed the wording so that masks are now heavily recommended over yeah, over somewhat recommended, but we heard from two students where one said they felt it was no masks and one felt that they said they thought it was optional. So it's not all being seen the same way. I get that I get that masks will help. I I think that we need to be much more open to having a variety of remote options, especially as we come into the next three months of illnesses and and a lot of kids out. Um, but I really think the ad hoc committee that we trusted with this in the first place needs to meet and needs to say, this is what has to happen now. I'm not, I think that we're taking it out of their hands. And that was a committee that we entrusted with this. So. All right. Thank you, Charlie. For the sake of discussion, I, uh, I'll say uh, let's take action tonight so I can at least hear what the alternatives are for what action we take. Okay, Patty. 
Uh, yes, I think we should take action tonight. Hey, Alicia. I guess succinctly, I'm on the fence. <laughs> Alicia. <laughs> So you, you want to uh, abstain from this poll? <laughs> no, I'd like to listen. I'm, I'm just, I'm really struggling with the idea that we have a matrix. And I don't know how we could have expected to get to that red level without having some identified clusters. I just, I just feel like I need more information and I'm, I'm open to hearing some ideas. Um, I struggle with just the blatant until winter break. I just don't know at this point. Okay. All right. Um, well, I guess I think um, it would be good if there was some uh, like brief, brief temporary um, kind of action just to buy us some, a bit of time so that um, we can have a more in-depth thought and, and input from perhaps the team that we, uh, the ad hoc committee. Um, I know that the nurses are a big part of that committee and they were part of what brought Ruben here, um, but there are other people on the committee. Um, so I think it would be great if we could get their perspective on how to handle, um, how to mitigate for clusters in this setting and also the, the whole staff piece not being accounted for I think that would be important and maybe they should look at that as well so I I would be for a temporary in you know, a short-term action until we can have something put in place that's got a deeper thought behind it So that is most of the board wanting some action. So now it's what? Well, we have the, the recommendations of the superintendent. They're up there on the board. Uh -huh. okay. And so what we need is board members to speak up and indicate what uh, action they would like to take, if any. I'd like a clarification though. We've got recommendations up there. We've got sample language, which I presume would be a fifth recommendation, like a recommendation to modify the matrix. Am I, if I, am I understanding clearly? No. Um, well, see, the sample language was if the board had wanted to. Uh, if, we, if we had a very specific action that you wanted to do and say, listen, this makes sense, let's go forward, let's put some language in place so that this type of situation, it gives leeway uh, to move forward. Um, you know, as I'm listening to everyone in, involved, uh, people from the community, as well as to um, the diversity on the school board as well, um, it one, I think, fairly concrete way of looking at it is um, if we make some movement similar to what we've already done, um, it's already part of our matrix. So I, you know, if you're changing the matrix or you're changing the framework or whatever like that. I'm hearing we need more thought put involved. We need more input involved. We need to look at other parts of the matrix and so forth. So the elementary already has like if this had happened at an elementary school we would have already put in place you know a masking requirement for five days and then move forward and assessed at that point in time i think that's a reasonable thing to put in place that puts you at a school board meeting as well it actually puts you at probably what tuesday to tuesday unless you have it as a um, calendar days, um, then it would just be to the end of the week. Uh, and then kind of uh, with, a, with a charge of um, 
seeing if we can get the committee back together to take a look at some of these questions. So is that your revised recommendation? Yeah, I, I, th I think <laughs> given the information I had today, given the conversations I had today, I, I, I do believe that some action has to be taken. Um, and we need to uh, act, act prudently. Um, when, when I see an increase in cases, that's not necessarily unexpected. When I see an increase in staffing situations, that's been a different trend. Mm -hmm. And knowing if that continues to take place, it's going to have another domino effect. I don't want that other domino effect to take place. And so if we can prevent, if we can stop the pattern and prevent so that from happening, I would like to do that. Taking into consideration that we do have a matrix, we do have a process and so forth that we're doing. I don't believe this takes away from that. This is taking a, a situation, an isolated situation uh, and handling it in a very similar way to what we've already done with the elementary school. Uh, and then we can, we can work on things from there if we need to be. I hear the need to, since, since a lot of what I've had to brought here tonight has a lot more to do with staff um, than it does have to do with anywhere else, that that needs to be a key part of um, the, data. the data going forward. I think it's helpful to frame the discussion in the context of the effect that this situation has on our current staffing situations. Um, I understand that and I hear that and I want and desire very much for children to be in school. If we don't have adults who are able to be in school with children, that is not what I want. Um, however, I do think that we need to stick to our ongoing reevaluation with the five day framework, which would be our approach, even if we were to be in the red category. Um, so I would consider a temporary um, adjustment to address this cluster specifically with the impact that it's having on our staff or on our ability to um, have staff in person in school. Um, but I really feel like it needs to be evaluated consistently and more frequently than just a, a straight um, three weeks. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yep. So other thoughts about this or does someone have a motion? Is someone ready for a motion? We should, I would back that motion. You, you like it, does <laughs> make that a doing the action, a temporary action now, but we want to see more frequent. Uh, you, give us a date and the ad hoc committee is going to meet next. That's, we need, they need to meet more often. The ad hoc committee, but I guess it was specifically speaking to um, reviewing the case data on that sort of five day rotation, the illness data. I think you're saying apply the language that's in there to the situation. Yes. To the cluster. Yes. Yeah. Right. So will that do what you need? Or... I, I think it will. I think it will. Um, like I said, it did do what we needed before uh, hand, and it gives us an opportunity to kind of sit back and reevaluate and, and make sure we connect with the nurses and uh, see what the trends are, see if things go down over a period of time. We do. Um, can I ask and, and, and it will bring us to another school board meeting well but not you know, only we that lot, we, we have a lot to do during, during that school board meeting so I think we, we're maybe not giving our, our own matrix enough credit I mean it does specifically say even just on the COVID-19 mitigation dashboard that that this could extend beyond the five days we're just going to really be looking closely at that information mm -hmm during that rotation. Yeah. So I'm not saying the, that this couldn't be longer than five days. Right. I just want there to be the data to back that decision. Sure, no, I think I think that makes sense and I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that. Um, when I, when we were going forward this morning, we were considering that very same thing because I thought the language engulfed what we needed. And, but when I read it closely, 
I realized that was not the wording mm -hmm. within the framework and I didn't want to take an action that the board had not approved uh, beforehand, realizing that, that you know, I, I didn't have the authority to do so. Uh, we, were, we were off with that uh, for the secondary school. Mm -hmm. I have to ask for a clarification. I, I, I recall that the matrix talked about implementing masking for five days in specific classrooms. Do you feel the language is adequate at this point for you to do it school-wide or building-wide, whatever you decide, or do you need that clarification address? I think that's more of one of the longer term ones and that tonight yeah. we're voting on an action. Nick, you, you have some information on that? Yeah, so the, the matrix in and of itself, we looked at percentages school-wide, which is what appears on the district's website. So everything was attached to changes within that matrix going from green to yellow to red. Um, obviously we've stayed in that yellow level pretty much, well, not the whole entire school year. Um, we've had periods where the sickness has elevated from green to yellow, but because of the um, substantial nature of community transmission, we've stayed in yellow. Um, all the language spoke to a five calendar day period and then a reassessment. That's where a lot of the language was given leeway to Ruben, to building principals, to nurses to be able to say, okay, we've had this change. It's been five days. Things have gotten a little better. We can have it end at five days or, hey, no, we're still seeing a large uptick in cases. We need to extend this. Um, in, the ad, in the ad hoc committee meeting, looking at the elementary level recommendations specifically there was discussions again about this concept of the middle high school being a larger building where people are moving around they're going to different classrooms whereas the elementary school has the individual classrooms so the thought process and the conversation dealt with looking at a higher percentage threshold because you only have you know maybe 13 to 18 kids in a class um, putting that 40% threshold in for elementary level so that you could say, okay, we have a sickness, you know, that has come in, it's taken out at least 40% of the learners. Um, because of that, we're going to implement masking for five days, then we're going to do it every, to my knowledge, unless there's anything I'm forgetting, everything references five calendar days and then a reassessment of data. Um, there, I, I'm having a hard time recalling the first meeting and recalling what we brought to the board specifically, but there was a discussion in the first ad hoc committee meeting about staffing and whether or not that should be included in any sort of matrix or decision making. Again, I, I, I'd have to go back to the meeting minutes to look to what level we brought that to the board specifically, but that is something that has been discussed at least at one point during the ad hoc committee recommendations. So. Um, Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, does someone the, the, have the purpose, purpose, Basically, in summary, the idea of what I'm talking about is having a strategy to stop a trend. If you can break the patterns, the ad hoc committee felt that the for you know two times in a row now that the um, after looking at data and so forth that what was in existence was working. Um, this situation just had had was not addressed in the framework and so uh, being able to have this type of situation addressed is, is helpful okay. I, I would like to just throw out I, I guess an understanding that i have and maybe others would understand this differently first of all i'm Thank you for those clarifications, Nick and Ruben. Sounds like you've got what you need at the moment, at least. But as I listen to the discussion of the matrix, as well as the work of the committee, it, it occurs to me that a matrix is a tool for you to use in your judgments and that a committee such as the ad hoc committee is basically an advisor to you, but that you, neither you nor the board can be completely uh, we, we can't completely rely 
on either the matrix nor the ad hoc committee who's done the best job they could mm -hmm. to you know to do our responsibility when you you know we have a, a part of the responsibility as the board you as a superintendent mm -hmm. obviously have a large amount of that and while you have to you know you have the benefit of the committee's recommendation you still have to act and the responsibility stops obviously with you and with us not not with the committee or the matrix yeah no absolutely i mean there were things in the first time around that i added to it you know for uh like the definition of recommended for instance there was nothing having to do with social distancing error i said i, de I defined that that piece right there because that was a clear um items so uh no and as as lisa talked i think lisa's correct you know how could we not have thought that there would be clusters um when we knew the numbers were going to be higher you know potentially um in hindsight you know that makes complete sense i think that part of what we um because we had zero or at least zero evidence of transmission in the past very hard to um, think that that was going to take place within the school, within the school setting, and the, even and we've had very minor, really considering again, some other places have had a lot more. We have not had significant amounts of that, but it has happened, and it is a jolt to our uh, practices. It's a data point. I don't think we should ignore. Is my point. It's possible the time over the past you know weeks and so forth because some of this happened you know, um, you know perhaps around the Thanksgiving time frame, uh, but just just prior to that, getting all that information, getting the confirmation during the vacation that we had clusters in those areas, um, that you know things have taken care of, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. Couple, couple that coupled with the increase in numbers in this school because we didn't see the increase in numbers at range we didn't really see any increase in numbers in jaffrey grade schools is this particular school today anyway motion i'll make a motion lisa i'd like to make a motion that we implement masking for chs and jrms for 10 days and not not part of the motion i would like to revisit the language at our next school board meeting all right so we have a motion this motion is 10 days Just as a point of uh, clarity for the motion, are you referring to 10 calendar days or 10 school days? Um, let's do 10, can, what, what is your thing, two weeks? Uh, let's do 10 school days with the proviso that it can be extended should trends necessitate without the school board having to vote on it. All right, so we have a motion. Okay, so I'm going to second Lisa's motion for purposes of discussion. I think we need to decide what to what to do with that. So I'm going to second. Okay, so we have a second. Is there any further discussion? I would prefer if it was. Um, <clears throat> keeping it closer to the framework um, that it was five days and that would get us to our next school board meeting. I think right, five school heard. days, you're saying? Five school days, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think, accept that. Yeah, I, I think I've kind of made okay, that Okay, so uh, Christine's suggesting a modification to the motion? Yes. All right. I, I accept that modification. Okay, so you would second that modification? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, no. I think I would do it that way. 
the, the maker can change the motion, but somebody else needs to second it. Second it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I need someone to second Christine's amendment. Second. Other than who said No, no, no. <laughs> Lisa <laughs> amended her original. Oh, motion. okay. So Lisa amended her original motion, and now someone has to second that new motion. I am Mrs. Scotty, and I am amend. I am seconding the amended motion to be five days starting okay. tomorrow. Okay. Revisit it. So now I think we have this properly. <laughs> There's Lisa amended her motion, and Patty has seconded the amendment. Is there any further discussion? Yes, I do not understand why we would want to include JRMS if the issue that the cluster is in CHS. Well, for one thing, and I think maybe I'm wrong, but I actually believe we have situations where middle school students have um, in their schedule, they eat lunch in the high school cafeteria and high school students on occasion, depending on their schedule, eat lunch in the middle school cafeteria. So there's an opportunity at, you know, where there's significant transmission that's possible. They, they, they also share the same media center. Yeah. There are some notes that things go in. Not that no. We're just doing a fact check. Yeah. Okay, so I, I feel like some my students have had that experience, but not this year, but in other years. I think I, there are uh, some middle school students because of the schedule, because they have some classes at the high school, do go to the high school cafeteria yeah. during that time frame. I don't think that it is reverse. The reverse. Okay. Yeah. So, do we want to say amend? the amended <laughs> to um, if someone from the middle school goes into what is designated as the high school, they must be masked. So the clusters are specifically only in the high school. And we're here to respond to the clusters. So I really support Charlie's point that if we're responding to the clusters, then the motion should be specific to the, the school in which the clusters are located. I guess what about, I don't want to, is there a point where a high school student would be in the middle school other than, you know, I, they don't go there for lunch. They pass through there, obviously, to go to the gym. So there are some who would go to some classes that are fairly close to my office. Okay. Uh, there are middle school kids who come to this side of the building. Um, to have classes, they're middle school classes, they're not mixed classes per se. I think the, the bigger deal is the mixedness of it all. Um, you know, they share the same library media center, which is a they do, big They do area. share the same library media center. You're correct. And the teacher and the, and the faculty, but the teachers, do they share common spaces? The, te the staff room is in the middle school. No, it's the high school, but in the high school. Okay. In, in this side of the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. It moved. I'm sorry. I was thinking last year's. Yeah, I mean, I think that it had less to do with the space and more to do with the, the students. Mm -hmm. um, so Yeah, so, I mean, that's why I had said CHS because I was trying to be as close to what we would we do with RMS, JR, uh, sorry, uh, JGS, and so forth. We do have the building combined, so um, there are there are those things to think about. Ruben, there, is, there is crossing back and forth to so some is, to some degree. Hmm? It, this is a time for discussion. So yeah. yep, this is good. Uh, Charlie's added to the discussion and, and Alicia. And so you, you've got two recommendations here, one and two that go in sort of different directions in terms of this question, uh, including JRMS. What would your recommendation be? I think we're one school. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would do that. 
if we were, but if we were going to stay truer to the concept of the framework, then it would just be CHS. That was where the that's where it was. So, but w so is that what you want us to do? Uh, I would, I think I my first answer was what I think we should do for one school. Okay. But one one is better than, you know, not having any. In my opinion, is my point with the second statement. And there are teachers who teach across both. That is, that is true. I'd like to just add that conversation to our list of long-term um, framework issues to address because it's very diff difficult to, to parse out the two schools but make decisions. It's just, it, it needs to be looked at in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, and as I'm asked, you know, listening to the question, I report out not as, you, not typically as, CHS JRMS, I, I put CHS is here. I, I did it tonight, right? So I separated them tonight. But for the purposes of what we're talking about, we do have staffing that crosses the entire school. Many of the extracurriculars are joint. The middle school and high school have mm -hmm. many extracurriculars the, the, together. This the activities year, that we have just, are joined. They are intermingled. OK, so I believe, uh, check me if I'm wrong here, that the motion is um, that we implement masking for the middle school and high school um, for a period of five days and watch the trends. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I have right now. Um, the only, I guess, again, clarification, it sounds like there was a mention of referring closer to the framework and then also looking at school days. So is it school days or calendar days? And I is think we clarified that and said it was school days. Okay, so we're still on school days, five. Okay. And I, I have an good authority that there are a ton of masks. So there are three masks for everyone. Like. <laughs> <laughs> you do not have to worry about ever not having masks because we will make sure that those masks are readily available at every entrance and et cetera, right? Well, we've ordered some more. We have been going through them quite quickly, yeah. Okay, so um, we have a motion, we have it seconded. Um, it's been modified, it's been discussed. And I feel like, you know, we've probably had enough discussion, heard a lot of, uh, comments that it's time for a vote. So, John. Aye. Thank you. Christine. Yes. Thank you. Lisa. Yes. Thank you. Charlie. No. Thank you. Patty. Yes. Thank you. Alicia. I'm going to abstain. Okay. Or does it have to be no? You can abstain. Okay. Um, and I say yes. So that passes with five yeses, one no, and one abstention. So um, I think for our board meeting, which is on the 6th, um, we need to uh, have deeper thoughts and discussion. Um, and it'd be great if the, um, the ad hoc group could get together um, about the inclusion of staff, um, how best to mitigate clusters. You know, we're doing what we can right now, but maybe there's a better way. Um, and then do we, try and differentiate how would we do that if we did between the middle school and the high school or is it just we need to look at it as one school so are there any other board what yes i just want to say um what a tremendous um I don't know, challenge this will be for our teachers and our administrators and certainly the, the learners um, to make an adjustment to this. And we're, I just wanna be sure that every 
one knows how much effort went into thinking this through and that everyone's best interest is in our minds, both those at home who are compromised, those the kids being out of school is really detrimental. I mean, not just to their education, and I, and I appreciate what Ruben said about the social, but in real time, it is extremely hard to make up 10 days out of school and still keep your grades passing. And I think that we are, our goal all along has been to keep kids in class learning to the best of their abilities. And this is just one of those pieces. So I, I think it, it's gonna be hard. It's not gonna be easy. And if everyone could please keep a positive attitude that we're just trying to do the very best we can. That's all. All right, thanks, Patty. Any other board matters? Okay, um, can I have a motion for adjournment? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, a second. I'll second, second that. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for coming out and, and addressing this issue uh, on such short notice. Take care, everyone. Take care, Marcia. Thanks.